All right, welcome <coughs> to this lecture number 11. And when I look at the schedule, I had expected there to be 12 lectures. There seems to be one missing on the lectures, uh, on the schedule. So um, uh, we will book another one. And you can think for a while about when uh, a suitable time would be next week, Monday, Tuesday, something. Okay? No, after the exam. Um, <clears throat> let's look at some sort of a summary of what we've done so far. You remember the source program uh, <clears throat> and the scanner which translates to tokens and then you have the parser uh, which interprets or rather analyzes the program according to the grammar. Uh, then you have the semantic analysis phase, where we look at data types. And then intermediate code generation. Intermediate code generator. That translates the program into yet another representation. And then we have uh, the co uh, machine independent optimizer. Man, machine, I can't spell. Machine in. And after that, we have the code generator that generates actual target code. And a final phase after that one is the machine dependent optimizer, machine and you get the target code. Now, so far, we've worked quite a lot with the parser, a bit with the scanner, and a bit with the semantic analysis. So we're sort of here. And in the final two lectures, we'll do all the rest. Uh, <coughs> intermediate code generator. Uh, why do we have that? Well, <coughs> why not optimize the code from the trees from the parser? or the decorated parse trees from the semantic analysis, or um, something else. Why create a specific type of code for the optimizer? Because the intermediate code generator, uh, this intermediate code is mostly designed to be possible to optimize. And I think I've said before that optimize does not mean necessarily to make it optimal in the sense of the best possible. It just means improve it, <coughs> make it smaller and faster. So today we will mostly talk or we will talk about these two phases and probably the next lecture that was missing in the schedule we will also talk about this a bit. Uh, not so much about the code generator. We will say something about the code generator, but uh, <coughs> I think that the code generator is probably the one of all these phases that you will have the least use of unless you actually write compilers for real physical machines. Uh, if you write an interpreter or if you um, use the knowledge from this course to analyze text that is not necessarily a program. It could be uh, various types of definition files, initialization files, and so on. Uh, <coughs> you don't need the code generator. Okay. I said that the intermediate code is mostly so the optimizer has a convenient form to work on. It's also, it can also be used to separate the front end of the compiler and the back end. Uh, the front end is the part that works with the source code. 
and the back end is the part that works with generating target code. And if you have separated those two, then it's easy, or much easier than otherwise, to create a compiler for a new type of machine. You have the, the source code, you have the source analysis port, you don't need to change that. You just need to change the, uh, uh, this port that actually works with generating code and uh, optimizing that machine dependent code. And if you want to create a compiler for a completely different language, but for the same uh, type of computer, well, then you change the front end. So it's, it's <coughs> useful to uh, divide it like this. I said that the intermediate code is easier to optimize than many other types of representations of the program. And for example, if you look at uh, this expression, and we should probably not use two here, we should use the variable a, so it can't be completely calculated. Now, <coughs> Obviously, we as humans can see that, oh, this one times this, th this can be uh, optimized away. And if we look at a tree, the syntax tree for this expression, then, yes, you can work with the syntax tree and you can see that one times, okay, here you have multiplication and one side is number one, then you can remove this entire part. So you can work with the syntax trees and uh, for uh, those of you who do lab 7 you will uh, do optimization like this. It is not so easy to work with the postfix code. You remember postfix code, right? 1a3 plus times. Here it's not, not at all very easy to see that this one and this multiplication uh, have anything to do with, it, with each other. Also, we will see that uh, on this level uh, there are things that um, the, um, there are things below this level that we can't optimize away because we can't see them. For example, if you have an array, this is the array or let's call it W. You have three places. If I <coughs> do um, W index 1, I want to access, and if it's C, you remember that in C uh, it starts with A index, C, uh, correction, W index 0, then you have W index 1, and then you have W index 2. If the address that I put this array W is, let's say, 1000, what is the address here of element 1? Well, that depends on what does this array contain. If it contains characters, then this is probably address 1001. But if it is integers, on normal computers you have 32-bit integers and 8-bit bytes, which means that this item here will start on address 1004, and this will start on 1008. And when you work with these uh, addresses to find the right place here, you, you need a multiplication by 4 that is not at all visible in the source code or in the tree or in the postfix code. So if you have a, another representation that um, where you can see 
these uh, multiplications by four, uh, then you can optimize away some of those. And we will see an example of that later. Okay. One way of representing the program as intermediate code is three address code, and we'll look at what that is. The idea here is that each instruction in the three address code has three addresses. Uh, it could be something like that the variable a is set to b plus c. Or it could be that if a is less than b, jump to code position c. Or it could be a is element is set to element C in the array B. All of these use just three addresses. Because A, B, and C, those are addresses in the program. The variables are some stored somewhere in memory, and also the address C that we jump to is somewhere in memory. So how do you work with an expression like this? Well, you could think you could say that okay, three addresses. I just do a special instruction for x plus y times z, but where do I then put the result? Because remember, now it's no longer a stack machine as we saw uh, some previous times. Uh, here we need to put the result somewhere. So if I want to use this expression, uh, first I can look at it as a tree. And then I need to use at least one temporary variable. Uh, let's say I say that, okay, I do the multiplication first and put it in the variable temp1. So then I can get three address code. First of all, temp1 is set to y times z. And then Here I have temp2. Temp2 is set to x plus temp1. Now, <clears throat> if this was part of a real program, we would probably not just do this, we would put the result somewhere, let's say. Uh, the variable a is set to this. And then we get another step here. a is set to temp2. Uh, you might realize that we could optimize away this step here and put x plus temp1 directly in a. But uh, let's leave that for the optimization phase. Because what I want to show here is that each internal node in the tree uh, that shows the expression, <coughs> will have a temporary variable. And you don't reuse these variables. You create a new temporary variable for each node. Okay. Slightly more advanced example. A is B times minus c plus b times minus c. So
So we translate this to a tree. And then we have the um, assignment as the top node. And since plus has higher precedence than the multiplication, and unary minus, this minus that only has one operand, has the very highest precedence, uh, should be done first. Then uh, I get the plus here. I get a multiplication here, b, times, and as I said, minus c, unary minus, just one operand to that minus. And over here we have actually the same thing. And you remember, each internal node in the tree gets its own temporary variable. So let's say this minus here can be temp1, this can be temp2, or just say t1 and t2, uh, t3, t4, t5. And now I can fairly easily generate this three address code here. I say that, well, I need to start down here because I can't do anything be before I've, I can't multiply before I've done minus, minus, and I can't add before I've done uh, the multiplication. So I need to start with T1 here. So T1 is set to minus C. Uh, T2 is B times T1. And T3 is minus C. And I'm sure you realize some optimization possibilities here. Uh, T4 is B times T3. And we have the addition. T5 is T2 plus T3. And finally, A is set to T5, like this. So, now we have the three address code for this uh, assignment statement. Yes? T5 is T2 plus T3. Ah, thank you, thank you. This is wrong. Uh, T4. Okay, now we hopefully have the correct three address code. One thing you can ask yourselves now is that, oh, am I generating new source code of some kind here that we then need to scan and parse another time? Uh, no, this is not stored as text. Instead you store it, let's say we have um, a, um, an array of records where you have first a type field which says which instruction is this. Oh, it could be u minus, unary minus. And what is the operand? It is c. And on the next row, no, correction, uh, I need to have the uh, place where we put the result also. And then <coughs> the operand C. And then we have uh, uh, T2 is set to B times T1. Then we might have a multiplication or times uh, instruction here in the record. That says that T2 is set to B times T1. And then uh, we have another honor minus that sets T3 to minus C, and so on. And these could be structs where this is a type field, and then I have three pointers or three addresses. So we don't need to 
re <coughs> read this as text. If you look at the types of three address instructions, uh, you have um, the basic ones or these ones. You have an operation with two uh, arguments and put, you put the result somewhere. Or this one which just has one argument. So you have of the type x is set to y some operation z, such as multiplication. You also have the other one, like this. And you can also do a straight copy, like the one I think I had there before I deleted it. Uh, <coughs> you just copy one variable to another one. And x and y and z, is of, uh, they are of course uh, just any variable name. They could be a, b, c, or t1 and t2 and so on. Then, just as when we worked with the um, stack machine and the postfix code for the stack machine, I need to jump around in the program. So I need jumps. I need an unconditional jump. Go to x. I jump to some place in the program. And I also need conditional jumps. So if some condition is true, jump somewhere. So if x uh, has some relation to y, for example, it's equal to or smaller than. If that is true, jump to z. Those are the basics. Now we have some more advanced uh, instructions. For example, when we work with functions that can be called, we need to be able to call a procedure. So call the procedure, uh, let's call it P, with a certain number of arguments, N. For example, call printf with eight arguments. And where do we get these arguments? Well, we have specific instructions called param for parameter. Uh, take this value and put it somewhere so we can send it to this function. And if you can call a function, you need to be able to return values from the function. So we have return x. And as I at least hinted it before here, uh, when we work with arrays, we need to be able to get one element in an array. So we have something like, like x, y, z. Then we can only copy to another variable. We can't perform operations such as plus uh, something because then we would have one, two, three, four addresses and that doesn't fit here in our three address code. So <coughs> copy one, the contents of one place in the array to a variable and of course the other way also x index y is set to z. And we assume here of course that this y is an array and this x is also an array. And if you have pointers, then um, if you're familiar with the C syntax for in the programming language C and also C++, uh, get a pointer to the variable y 
and put it in variable x. And you can also follow that pointer. What does this mean? It means follow the pointer y to wherever it points, take the value that's stored there and copy it to variable x. And if we can follow a pointer and get a value from where that pointer points, we can do it the other way around and take a value and put in the place where one pointer points. So, star x is set to y, which means follow the pointer in variable x to wherever it points, and in that place put a copy of whatever is in y. And for this I am using syntax from C. Uh, in reality it would be something like, uh, let's say the last one. It could be P store for pointer store, X and Y. So don't get too hanged up on uh, the syntax here because it's just uh, a way to, uh, some way to show what, what um, the instructions do. Thomas, yes? Question number 12 or 11, can we have an additional operation after Y? Uh, we could, it would still be three address code, but it's probably easier to not do that. Uh, we do things step by step. We don't need that because, I mean, if I want to add something I can I can do it using a temporary variable. Okay. You remember um, syntax directed translation and um, uh, attributes in the syntax tree. For example, if you have um, a part of the syntax tree that I deleted here, C, and I think it will be times minus C. I think, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can add uh, a couple of attributes to the nodes in this tree. First of all, <coughs> the temporary variables. You remember that each internal node in the tree gets its temporary variable. So let's call it address because this is the address where I will put the result. So the address of this might be T1. And I can also generate code here. What is the code to generate this value? Well, it's T1 is set to minus C. So this is the code. So now you have two attributes, uh, address and code. And if we go up here, what is the address of this one? Well. It's another temporary variable, so I think it was called T2 before, and we can call it T2 again. And what is the code to generate this one? Well, <coughs> it is B times T1, of course, but we also have the code to generate the value of T1. So when we uh, generate code for calculating T2, we need to use all the previous code that we use. So I take T1 is set to minus C, and then after that one, I add the next one. T2 is B times T1. So I sort of chain new instructions at the end uh, on the code. 
as I go upwards in the tree. So now we can look at how to write this as this um, uh, syntax directed translation. For example, multiplication. You will have, uh, if we use this type of um, syntax directed translation, that is called a syntax uh, directed definition, where you have the production and then a semantic rule. Then you would have the production that an expression, let's call it expression one, can be expanded to expression two times expression three. And what will the semantic rule be? Well, <clears throat> you need to do what we did here. First, find a new temporary variable that you can use. And then take the code needed to um, calculate the values in the subtrees. In this case, it was just uh, this one. Uh, chain it together with the instruction to calculate the multiplication here. So you would do something like this. First of all, expression one, that's the multiplication node. Uh, dot address is set to a new uh, temp variable. So let's say we have a function called make new temp that gives us the name of a previously unused temporary variable. You can just have a counter one, two, three, so you get t1, t2, and so on. So now you have, in this case, t2. And then you need to set the code. And as I said, the code was first the code for the left subtree, then the code for the right subtree, and then this final instruction that just multiplies them together and stores them in T2. So it would look something like expression one dot code, and then we chain it together. Um, yeah, just, let's just say plus. Uh, expression two dot code plus. And in this case, expression one code would be empty because it doesn't need any code. And then I create an instruction. I say instruction here, that is. Uh, this instruction here, t2 is set to b times t1, and t2 I get from this node's uh, temporary variable, that is uh, expression dot address, this one. And then um, it is set to, and what is it set to? Well, uh, expression one address, no correction, expression two address. Uh, this is expression two because uh, that's the left operand of the multiplication. Uh, expression two dot address and then I have a multiplication. And finally expression three dot address. So. So what this means is create an instruction uh, that uses the temporary variable for this node and sets it to the variable temporary variables for the two operand subtrees. Okay, do you understand? Do you follow me? Almost, yeah. I mean, all, all you're doing is you create a new variable to put the result from this sub node, and then you chain together the code to create that. And you already have the code for the subtrees. 
So you take that code and then at the end you put this instruction where you put the result of the multiplication into uh, the variable that you have generated for this node. Question. Yes? Why do we would? Why do we need to do all this stuff? Like, I feel like it's memory allocation. Ah. <clears throat> when we get to the end, our three address code program is finished. So just like when you, um, just like when you created uh, postfix code for the stack machine, now you have a program that can be executed given the proper uh, virtual machine. And when you get to the root of the tree that represent, represents the entire program, then you have all the code here. And again, the reason to create this uh, <coughs> three address code at all is to, so it's easier to optimize than, than other representations of the program. Okay, I'm not sure if that was an answer to your question or... Okay, okay. Uh, what do we do with statements? If I uh, <coughs> delete or rather erase some of this, if you have um, a while statement that says while and then you have uh, maybe an expression within parenthesis and you have a statement. While some expression is true, perform this statement. And the statement can be a block statement with curly braces. Well, you remember what we did with um, uh, the postfix code for the stack machine. We needed a label which is the start of the loop that we can jump to from the end. So, and we also needed a label at the end when we jump out of the loop. So it looks like something like this. You have start, here you calculate the expression. If expression is false, then go to, let's call the label after here. So we have a label after here. And then we have the statement that is the body of the loop. And here, uh, at the end of this loop, when we have performed the body, we jump back, go to start. And here, the rest of the program follows. So if expression is false, we jump out. Otherwise, we perform the loop, or rather the body of the loop, and jump back to the start to check this, uh, the expression again. So how would the production for this look? Well, it looks something like this. A statement is exactly what I wrote there. It is the keyword while, the left parenthesis, an expression of any kind, an end parenthesis, and a statement. And of course, a statement can be many other things too, but this is the while statement. And the semantic rule? How will that look? Well, I need two labels. And I can't call them start and after. I can't give them fixed names. Because then I can only have one single while loop in my entire program. So I need to have, just like I had a function called make new temp, that I can call to get a new temporary variable, I need a function that can be called make new label, that gives me a new label. Maybe it's just a number. And I need to have this label and this label. So let's do it like this. Um, start is set to make new label and 
after Elika uh, is equal to or set equal to make new label. So now I have the two labels and all I need to do now <coughs> after the break is to generate the code with a, um, well I need the expression of the statement but I also need uh, this conditional jump and this unconditional jump. But we finish with that after the break. Okay, 15 minutes. All right, let's continue with um, uh, this uh, semantic rules, that, uh, this semantic rule that builds a while loop, uh, builds code for a while loop for us. We have created two new labels for start and after, and we now need this code put in between them. And as before, the code uh, <coughs> will be an attribute of the node here, statement.code is set to. And the first instruction in the code, or the first thing we put in the code, is this label. So first I have uh, an instruction that says label before. Label. Before. And as we've said, uh, not before, start it's called. And as we've said, it won't say, actually say label start. It will replace start with whatever label I generated using make new label. And then after that instruction, we uh, have our if. Uh, if, and what is the condition? Well, this is a node. I mean, I have an expression, a subtree that is the expression. And like all other expressions, we uh, use this address attribute to tell the name of the variable where this expression's result, where its value is put. So if expression.address is set to, is equal to false. And this will be actually the output. So I say if and equals to false, uh, go to, and I need the go to also to be actually output. But what do I go to? I go to this after label. So now I make an instruction that says, oh, I should say instruction here too, because it is an instruction I created. So now I have two instructions, first the start label and then this conditional go to. Then we have the statement. So I just take the code for the subtree that is the statement. So I add in the chain of code. I add uh, statement.code and now we have two different statements here. We have uh, the while statement, let's call it statement1 here, and we have the body of the loop. So not to get those confused, uh, it is code for statement1 I'm creating and what I put in there is the code from this statement, which is statement two. So, statement two dot code. And then I need these two things, the unconditional go to and the label after. So I just add an instruction that says go to start and 
the instruction that is the label after. So instruction label after. And don't expect this syntax I used here to exist anywhere. It's just something I invented now to be able to show you that we build the code for this while loop uh, using some instructions for the three address code. Okay? Questions? I mean, again, we see that we can use these uh, syntax directed translations to generate data types, values, temporary variables, code, and so on. It's just attributes we put in the tree. Okay. Let's leave uh, the three address code for, for um, the moment and start talking about code optimization. And first, let's talk about what we can call hand optimization. That is done by the programmer who writes the code. Uh, if we have a, um, let's say, this loop, a for loop, for integer i, and as long as i is less than n, which we assume contains the number of places in an array. And of course we need plus plus i. And in the loop we call some function called do something. And we send whatever is stored at position i in the array a. Now, if you think about this, uh, a for loop in C can be um, translated to, by just moving around the parts to a while loop. The, uh, oh, I forgot the uh, <coughs> setting i uh, to zero first, because otherwise we don't, this will not work as we hope it to. Uh, set i to zero, as long as i is less than n, uh, do something. So here we have the body of the old for loop. And we need plus plus i like this. Now, when we look at this, we realize that, okay, here we have the array A, uh, N places, and I, to start with it, references uh, position zero, the first one. If we, think, if we think about what happens here, we might say something along the lines that, okay, this, what does array indexing do? Well, it takes the address to A, this place, it adds I steps. So you move, so we say the pointer that points to A, I steps forward. So could we simplify this and maybe not exactly simplified, but make it faster. Well, let's use a pointer. I have a pointer that points to the first element, and then I use it to step through the array. And then, to know where I stop, I have a pointer called after. And then I write this perhaps somewhat complicated code. Uh, P is set to point to the first element. Uh, then I do a while loop that says as long as p, uh, <clears throat> oh, I need after also, um, 
after is at to point to a index n. I mean, that will point to immediately after the array, where the next element would have been if it had existed. And then I do a while loop, while p is less than after, and in the loop I call this uh, do something function with whatever p points to this time. And then I step the pointer p forwards. So now I don't need to go back to a, multiply with the number of i's, and um, get where, where the ad address of um, uh, this uh, place is. I just step one step forward in each iteration of the loop. So my question now, <coughs> does this work? Well, the first question is, does it work? Depends. Depends on... If it's C, then we need to know the size of the database. Well, um, yeah, it, it, it will work in C because the, the um, plus plus P here will step over as many bytes as needed. So that, that, type, that thing works, yes. Uh, anything else that might not work? Well, it works. I mean, it works. Uh, next question is, will it be faster? And there, we don't really know. It might be faster. It might be equally fast as the original loop, or it might be slower. Why would it be slower? Well, let's say the compiler is good at optimizing things, and it immediately recognizes this as, oh, this is a for loop that steps through an array. And then it uses some very smart uh, CPU instructions to do that. Then it sees this, and suddenly it's far from obvious that we're just stepping through an array. So the compiler might very well do worse optimization on this code than this one. And anyway, even if it's faster, is it worth it? Let's say we have a compiler that doesn't do very smart optimizations. So this new version is actually a bit faster than this one. Is it worth it? Depends. I mean, the code is much more complicated. It's harder to write. It's easier to get it wrong. It's harder for new programmers who are going to work with my program to understand it. And also, it won't be very much faster, even if it's faster, because here we have a function call. And the function call will be much slower than all of these things. I mean, you need to store, you remember, store things, uh, allocate a uh, <coughs> activation record, store CPU registers and stuff there, jump to another place in the program, and so on. So, this is probably not something you should do. And in general, hand optimization, optimizing your programs by hand to make them faster, uh, is usually not something we should do. Uh, there is a rule, or rather two rules, about hand optimizations. Two rules. And the first rule is don't do it. And the second rule, <laughs> no, actually for experts, there is a rule for experts, uh, don't do it yet. Wait, so you can't do it if you are an expert? Well, the thing is, <coughs> so if you feel, oh, I really need to optimize this, this looks slow, I need to fix it so it's faster. Uh, don't do it. Yet, I mean, don't do it. You'll just complicate your program, you'll probably introduce errors, and it's probably not worth it. But sometimes it turns out that, oh, <coughs> the program is too slow. 
And even though I turned on optimization in the compiler, it's still too slow. Then, I don't do it yet. What I do is I profile the program. And what does that mean? It means you run the program with special code that measures what parts take most time. I once wrote a uh, five in a row, look for fucking Swedish, in Swedish, uh, <coughs> program. And it turned out that what took most time was initializing a hash table at the start of each move. So initializing the hash table was the slowest part, what needed to be optimized. And that wasn't easy to guess. You need to, to profile and run the program and see, okay, first of all, it's too slow. And second, the reason it's too slow is this part. Then you can look at that part and maybe optimize it. But in general, don't do it. <coughs> uh, turn on optimization in the compiler, so the compiler speeds up the code. But otherwise, you might actually need to optimize things. And if it turns out we need to optimize things, How? Well, three ways we can optimize it. Uh, the first part I would call low-level optimizations, such as the one I showed here. You can replace a normal for loop with a pointer that is stepped through instead of an integer. Uh, this is usually not very useful. I mean, sometimes it will speed up the program a bit. But what can be much more useful is data structures and algorithms. Uh, <coughs> first of all, because this can improve the speed enormously. This might make the program twice as fast. Yes, that's very nice, the low-level optimizations if you do them right. This can make it thousands of times faster. It can be the difference between years of execution time and seconds. I mean, replace a long linked list with a hash table. And also, <coughs> this, the low level optimizations, replacing an integer index with a pointer, that is something the computer can do for you. The compiler can do this in the optimization step. Replacing your linked list with a hash table that's something that's really hard for the compiler to do. So if you want to do that, you need to do it by, uh, for yourself. Okay. Wait, wasn't there a first? Yeah, uh, let's ignore that. Oh. <laughs> it's machine dependent optimization. It's really not something you usually do, but when you Sometimes you see that, okay, I did this and the compiler generates this instruction, which is fine, but on this new processor I bought, it's not actually a machine instruction, it's emulated, so it's suddenly very much slower. And you can think, look at those things. Yeah. Um, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, yeah. Next step, uh, optimization done by the compiler. So let's leave hand optimization. Don't do it and don't do it yet. And look at the optimizer. And this is the machine independent optimizer. It makes improvement of the code that um, will work on any compiler. Let's say, remove this multiplication by one or addition by zero. And we need to talk about something called a basic block and a flow graph. And what is a basic block? Well, let's have some simple code. Uh, the variable tot, which means total, is set to zero. Then I have a loop 
for uh, i is set to zero as long as i is less than 10 uh, plus plus i equals i add i to the total and then I print it. This is not, uh, well, it could be C code if, there, if you made a function called print that prints a number. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's create three address code for this. Well, this part is easy. Total is set to zero. And then you remember that we do this before the loop, i is set to zero, then you have a label, let's call it label one, and this condition, if it's not true, we jump out of the loop to L3, which is down here. So if I is, and then we inverse that one, if i is greater than or equal to 10, go to L, why did I call it L3? L2 is better. <coughs> Label 2. And what do I do inside the loop? Well, I do the loop body. Total is set to total plus i. And also um, plus plus i. And then at the end, go to L1 because I jump back to the start. Okay, is this reasonable three address code for this program snippet? Yeah, I think so. Now, when we optimize things and have a lot of instructions here, let's say A is set to two, B is set to three, C is set to B. <coughs> when I optimize this and see that, okay, B is copied to C, but I know that B will be 3, so maybe I can replace B with a 3. That only works if we've done this before. If we have a jump into the code just before, then I can't do that optimization. And also, if I... Um, if there is suddenly a jump out, go to LX, in the middle of the code. Then, if I move things later, it might not be performed because I jumped out. So, what I want to do when I optimize code is to have a piece of code that is run from the start to the end, and then do optimization <coughs> on that. And that is a basic block. A basic block has no jumps into it, except maybe to the beginning, or it could just continue running from before, and you have a jump into it at the start, and it has no jumps out, except maybe at the end you can jump out. So you know all the instructions in the block will be performed one by one. And if I look at this code over here, uh, this is a basic block, this is a basic block, this is the basic block, and it seems I forgot the print part. Um, you remember how I do a print? We use first param, tut, and then call the function print with one argument, like this. Uh, and that will also be a basic block.
because all all these blocks are just get uh, you have uh, this one you have this one or or that one and you have this no this one uh, <coughs> None of them have any jumps into the middle, and none of them have jumps out from the middle. You can have jumps at the end like this, and you can have jumps to the beginning. And I can't merge these two blocks into one, because then I would have a jump in the middle out from the first instruction here. And this, when I added the arrows here, uh, then it's a flow graph. Because the flow graph consists of basic blocks with instructions in them and uh, how we can jump between the blocks. Either by jumping like this or by just continuing execution on the next instruction. Some terms that are used uh, to define a variable. In this context, it means set its value. Uh, here I set, for example, the value of total and i. Here I set the value again of total. So I define the variables. And this is not the same define as when you say define a variable in C. There define a variable means you create the variable. You write int i, okay, now the variable exists, but it has no value yet, it just contains whatever garbage happened to be in that place in memory. But when we, in this context, talk about defining a variable, it means setting its value. So when we, for example, here, then the variable i has an undefined value. If we use a variable, it means get its value. So uh, here we use the variable i. Here we use the variable total and we also define it. And so on. A live variable. That is a variable that may be used later. Will maybe be used later. So if I look at the value of i here between these then yes, it's still live, it will still be used because plus plus i takes the old value and adds one. Uh, when I'm here, then i is no longer live because it's not used anymore when I got down here. A dead variable is not live and dead code. Well, in some contexts when you say dead code, you mean code that will never be executed. But here it means code that sets values of variables that are dead. So if I, let's say, um, uh, here set i is set to 17. Well, i is dead, I'm not using i anymore, so this instruction is dead code. It will be executed, yes, but it will not do anything useful, it will just set the value of a dead variable. And you use this during optimization to see, okay, uh, <coughs> which variables can we remove? Which assignments can we move around in the code? Maybe put things outside a loop, so it's not done in each iteration of the loop, but only once. 
So, some optimizations that can be done on a basic block. Uh, if we have this uh, basic block with these four instructions, which can we do something about? We uh, <coughs> assume they are inside a basic block like this. So, do we have any common sub-expressions? Things that can be eliminated because we calculate them more than once. C, C this mean? C is set to B plus C. Yeah, we have it twice, yes. Do you agree it's, it can maybe be optimized away? Some, some of you are shaking your heads. Why can't we reuse this value? I mean, I calculate B plus C and put in an A. Can't I use A here? Why not? Yeah, I mean, B has changed. So B plus C is not the same as it was here. So I can't remove this one and use A instead. On the other hand, do we have another one? Yeah, d is set to a minus d. So these two calculate the same value. So we can remove it. We call it elimination of common sub-expressions. Common And what I do is I have A is set to B plus C as before, I have B is set to A minus D as before, I have C is set to B plus C as before, but D is not set to A minus D, I just reuse B. Okay? <laughs> and maybe later I can eliminate one of these variables. But you need to not just look at uh, the code and see, oh, B plus C, B plus C, it's the same. You need to look at, has some of that expression been redefined? We get a new variable value. Then we can look at dead code elimination. Now, it's not enough to just look at this basic block because afterwards some of these values may be used. But let's say that um, it's only C that is used in the rest of the code. Well, then this is dead code. Why should I use set D to something when it's not used? C Yes, it's used. Uh, B, well, B is B dead? No, B is not dead because it's used here. Is A dead? No, because it's used there. So if I remove dead code, dead code elimination, I get, well, the first three instructions. A is B to C. B is A minus D, and C is B plus C. So now we see we can remove the variable D completely, and this instruction D is set to B. We don't need it. Assuming that uh, D is not used. Yeah, assuming that only, only C is used. We can do some algebraic, algebraic transformations. This is the things we add zero and multiply by one and so on. So if you have code like this, A is uh, 
a plus zero, b is b times one, and c is d uh, raised to the power of two, that is d squared, like this. Well, what can you remove? Well, clearly you can remove a is set to a plus zero, if we assume this is normal number, numerical calculations. Uh, if a is a string, then something else might happen. Uh, <coughs> so we can remove this one. And b is set to b times one, we can remove that one too. And then we have square. C is set to d squared, if I use uh, Python syntax. Can, should we do something about that? We can't remove it. We can also multiply it by its body, body itself. Yeah. Uh, it may be that, depending on your, the CPU architecture, uh, <coughs> multiplication might be very much faster than uh, squaring something. This might require you calling the power function and it may, might be used, done in software. So maybe it will be faster if you just say, okay, multiply d by itself like this. And in that case, your, uh, this basic block uh, shrinks to just this uh, single instruction. Finally, a term, loop. What is a loop? Well, if I ask you what a loop is, you might say something, oh, it's when your program says either while or for, then it's a loop. Or maybe if you have a label and then it says go to L1. You can do that in C. Uh, but that is loops on the source code level. When you transform this into three address code, well, then it doesn't say while. All it says is a couple of labels and a couple of jumps. And the same thing with for, which at least in C is just another way of writing a, a while loop. So instead, a loop is defined by you look at the basic blocks and if it's a while loop this would be uh, the condition, the test, uh, conditional jump, uh, the body and the end, whatever comes after the loop. Uh, a loop is defined as a set of basic blocks that is strongly connected. And what does strongly connected mean? It means that from each block, each node in this loop, in this graph, uh, you can reach all the others. And where is our loop? Well, <coughs> It's these three blocks. I mean, from this one, you can reach that one and that one. From this one, you can reach this one and back to this one. And from this one, you can reach this one and this one. So from each node in this graph, you can get to all the other nodes. Each basic block in the loop uh, can reach all the other blocks. That is what a loop is. What is an inner loop? Well, it's just a loop that has no other loops inside. So, if I
let's see if I can get this right. Uh, I'm back there. Uh, then you have an inner loop that consists of these three nodes. I mean, you can go around here. From each node, you can reach all the others. And you have an outer loop, an outer loop. This one, you can get to all the others. You can get there. So you have an outer loop, which is all of this. But the outer loop contains the inner loop, so the outer loop is not an inner loop, but the inner loop has no loops inside. And it's useful to, to know these terms, what an inner loop is, because when you optimize things, or when you write the optimizer in the compiler that is to optimize this, which port should you concentrate on? What is most important to optimize? The main part. Yeah, because <clears throat> If the outer loop is done a thousand times and then the inner loop is done a thousand times in each outer loop, well, then this inner part here, the body of the inner loop, is done a million times. So that's where you should optimize. Okay, I didn't even get to the example which we then will do on the next lecture, which is later sometime. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you.